This is MPB News. Hi, this is Karen Brown. Thanks for checking out the Mississippi Edition podcast. If you like what you hear, click subscribe, hit like, or leave us a comment if your app has that feature. Then find other MPB podcasts by searching MPB Think Radio on your favorite podcasting platform. Thanks. Good morning. It's 8.30 on Monday, September 28th. I'm Karen Brown, and this is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. On today's show, state health officials are monitoring increasing coronavirus transmission in a number of Mississippi counties as fears of a rebound grow. Then, in part two of our Gulf States Newsroom Roundtable, how reproduction rights could be shaped by a conservative Supreme Court. Plus, an election commissioner outlines ballot procedures ahead of the November election. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Coronavirus transmission in Mississippi is leveling off, but health experts are closely monitoring several Mississippi counties that have increases in infection rates. On a Facebook Live roundtable, State Health Officer Dr. Thomas Dobbs says he's concerned the state could see a rebound in coronavirus cases soon. He says if people don't take the virus seriously, case numbers could go up. We have seen a mild little bump in mortality last week. It's kind of starting to curve down, so we'll have to watch that. Uh, we do. We look at so many different uh, 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 numerical measures. We have had a slight increase in the number of counties with, that are growing and not shrinking. It's a small number. It's like 14 counties now are having uh, increasing numbers of cases, but the rest of them are shrinking, so that's great. That's wonderful, but even a few days ago, it was 10 counties were growing, and now 14 counties are growing. So. These are that's just it's a really a small little thing, but we're watching everything closely. We want to make sure that we're ready for, to respond when we start seeing uh, any rebound. It's hard to imagine that we won't have rebound at some point. All this, especially as folks inevitably sort of start letting their guard down. We're seeing pressure for people wanting to be more social, and then certainly as the weather gets colder, we know that the indoor environment is the is the most efficient way to spread coronavirus. Dobbs' concern comes as the Southeastern Conference opened its football season Saturday. Health experts are warning that attending sporting events, either in a stadium or at a private house party, could lead to coronavirus transmission. Dr. Dobbs says he doesn't feel like anyone should be in the stands of a sporting event because of the risks of spreading coronavirus. You know, and I've said this a thousand times, I'll say it again. I don't think we should have anybody in the stands, and I'm uneasy about having sports in the fall anyway. Um, so that is just one level beyond what I think is a good idea. Um, but, you know, as a state, we have decided that we're going to prioritize athletics over many other things. We just have. And, um, and so we'll try to work with that. Um, you know, I think the 25% capacity is, um, a lot when we're still in the biggest pandemic of a century, although our numbers have dropped, they're stable. It, it makes very little sense to me to, it, it, I mean, to really let off the reins if we're stable. So, um, you know, we'll see how the governor interprets that. Um, but, you know, I, I don't think it's a really especially good idea. The State Fair, another highly anticipated event that traditionally attracts thousands a day, is also getting attention from health officials. Dr. Dobbs says they're exploring creative ways to monitor the fair to keep it as safe as possible for attendees. As far as the preparations go, I mean, you know, obviously we've made allowances for college football stadiums uh, and things outdoors. And so, uh, you know, Probably going to the state fair under the right sort of circumstances can be done pretty safely. And and we've been working with the commissioner of agriculture and his team on several things, trying to find out if we're going to have a fair, how can you do it safely? Um, part of it's going to be, obviously, it's not going to be the same kind of fair. It's going to be spread out. Um, the, the capacity is going to be limited to, I, th- I think, maybe 200 people per acre or something like that. So relatively well Loaded. spread out. Uh, universal masks. We're going to be, and that's really, really important. Whatever sort of indoor events they have in the sort of the coliseums are going to be really depopulated and they're kind of open air. And so I've looked at those with them trying to, you know, optimize spacing within the fair 
is part of the situation. And I even understand that they've got um, they've got drones flying overhead to see if people are not monitor are not maintaining a social distancing. So I think they're committed to doing it safely, and we're going to try to help in any way possible. The declining trends over the last two months have allowed for eased restrictions, and that now also includes nursing homes. Dr. Dobbs says those relaxed rules now provide for some in-person visitation. We're very excited that CMS or the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services has basically changed the rules and has made it a lot easier for, uh, for folks to visit the loved ones in nursing homes. So essentially, you can visit in a nursing home at pretty much any time outdoors, um, whether there's an outbreak or not. So that's a, a good a good concession. We're very happy about that. And the other one of the other ones is um, you can visit indoors unless it's like an outgoing outbreak or um, it's been within 14 days of the last new case, right? Right. So that's a lot a lot a lot more open policy than it was before. Mississippi has reported 96,859 cases of COVID-19 since March 11th with 2,919 related deaths. Coming up in part two of our Gulf States Newsroom Roundtable, how reproduction rights could be shaped by a conservative Supreme Court. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Deep South Dining is the show all about the culture of Southern flavor. From fried chicken and collard greens to shrimp and grits and a glass of sweet tea. Subscribe now to the podcast using any podcast app or download our MPB public media app. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Karen Brown. Over the weekend, President Donald Trump announced Judge Amy Coney Barrett as his nominee to replace the late Ruth Bader Ginsburg on the high court. Coney Barrett's nomination comes wrapped in scrutiny, as many Democrats argued the seat should not be filled during an active election, pointing to the 2016 example of the Republican-controlled Senate denying Merrick Garland a confirmation hearing during an election year. Advocates for reproductive rights are also tightly focused on the nomination and what it could mean for the landmark decision of Roe v. Wade. Mary Ziegler, a professor of law at Florida State University, joins us along with MPB's Desiree Frazier and Rosemary Westwood of WWNO in New Orleans in part two of our Gulf States newsroom on abortion laws. Mary Ziegler begins by examining the probability of the court taking up the case of Mississippi's 15-week abortion ban. The court might decline to hear it just because the the court doesn't want to deal. And by the court here, I mean in particular probably uh, Chief Justice Roberts and Brett Kavanaugh might not want to deal with a major abortion case in an election year. Why Brett Kavanaugh? Excuse me. But why Um, Brett Kavanaugh? Brett Kavanaugh, so, I mean, to say that there is a swing vote on abortion now, or if we added additional conservative to the court, is a little misleading, because swing vote makes it sound as if there's, you know, a 50-50 chance that that justice would go either way. And we're, we're really not talking about that. These are conservative justices who are likely to render conservative rulings. But of the four justices who would have upheld Louisiana's abortion restriction this summer, Kavanaugh seemed to be the most cautious. Um, in particular, he he wanted to essentially kick the case back down to the lower courts and to say that the court simply didn't have enough information about how Louisiana's law was working in the real world and whether that was different enough from Texas's law. If the court declined to hear Mississippi's motions, when would they be reintroduced? Uh, well, if the court declines, it denies a certiorari petition, right? I mean, there are different ways the court could decline to hear it, right? The court can just sort of continue kicking the can down the road and not deciding at all, right? Can just reassign the case to a later and later conference. Or they can just deny a, a Mississippi's request. If they deny Mississippi's request, then the last court ruling essentially saying the law is unconstitutional would stand. So um, then the case, at least for the time being, would be over. If, by contrast, you have something um, like a just willingness to keep reassigning, reconferencing the case, that could delay uh, an outcome one way or another for quite some time. Desiree, if the Supreme Court fails to hear Mississippi's cases, 
what does that mean? What would the reaction be, both from the uh, the clinic, the one clinic in Mississippi, and the legislature's response? On the legislature's response, um, their reaction would be to keep trying. Um, they are being very vigilant and looking for ways to end abortion. Uh, Governor Bryant, um, who was Governor Be- Bill Bryant, who was Governor before Tate Reeves, who began his term this year, uh, made it clear that he wanted to end abortion in the state. Uh, Reeves and the Republican supermajority has followed suit in what they have said about ending abortion. So whatever they can do to uh, team up with some of the organizations that were mentioned out of Washington, whatever organizations are doing and and working on to throt that, they are going to be eminently involved in it. Mary, what is the process if, uh, if or when we hear it's a woman is confirmed? Is she immediately sworn in? That kind of depends. I mean, I think there there may be efforts to um, delay a confirmation or nomination, but usually, yeah, once there's a positive vote um, there, and it seems likely now that there will be, we've seen um, what the kind of the Republican lawmakers who would have been the most in doubt um, starting to uh, signal that they would vote, at least that they're open to a vote. And it, it seems unlikely they would oppose a nominee on the merits. Um, so we could see a nominee confirmed before the presidential election, or at least before um, a new president takes office. Um, of course, you know, it's not inevitable that President Trump is going to lose the election, so he, the timeline might matter less in that event. Um, it's worth noting, too, that if a Democrat were to win, though, um, this this confirmation could have even more unpredictable ramifications for abortion. It's It's kind of ignited on the left talk about potentially packing the court, which could have significant effects on abortion in in states, including Mississippi and Louisiana. If it did, you had, for example, a Democratic president putting three or four more progressive justices on the court, then the ramifications of that for abortion in, in the nation and in Mississippi and Louisiana would be, I think, really hard to anticipate where we are now. It's interesting that both sides, I think, claim that Most Americans side with them. So it it certainly is a split issue. Um, I'd like to wrap this up by asking for some final thoughts from each of you regarding what might happen with the Supreme Court and how you think the reaction will be in your state from people who live, for instance, Rosemary in Louisiana. You go first. I think similar to Mississippi, the people who work for reproductive rights in Louisiana have been preparing for the end of Roe v. Wade for some time. They see, I I agree that they see that as a likelihood uh, in the future. And so already there are plans for, or discussions around what would they do? How would they provide care to people and aid to people who wanted an abortion if it wasn't available in Louisiana or Mississippi or Alabama or neighboring states. And from the position of anti-abortion activists, clearly it would be almost too good to be true. I'm sure some of them might say, I mean, there's a lot of um, setbacks that they feel that they've suffered over years of, of campaigning on this. And I think there's very much a hesitancy to assume that this justice will give them what they want immediately. There's a lot of optimism around it, but there's, you know, were Roe v. Wade to be overturned, I think it would even surprise them a little bit, just given how long they have pushed for that and found their efforts falling short of their goals. Desiree, Mississippi is certainly one of the most conservative states in the nation. What do you think the response would be from Mississippians? Yes, it's a very conservative state. Um, The pro-life movement has been very outspoken on this issue. If it were to be overturned, they would be elated. If it is not overturned, they will continue to work to overturn it. For those who don't support uh, a, a woman's right to choose, they are the minority. And yes, they are talking about how they would help women Um, As you heard mentioned, 
um, obtain abortions. The other issue here is that many of the women, not all, but many of the women who go to the clinic are African American or women of color. Um, there is the concern that they will bear the brunt of not being able to get an abortion, whereas white women would have more options. Those with means would be able to go to another state or even go out of the country if they so choose to have an abortion. And a very interesting conversation, and I thank you all. Mary Ziegler is a professor at Florida State University College of Law. She specializes in the legal history of reproduction, the family, sexuality, and the Constitution, and is the author of the book Abortion and the Law in America, Roe v. Wade to the Present. We say thanks to Rosemary Westwood. She is a public reporter for WWNO in New Orleans and Desiree Frazier, legislative reporter at Mississippi Public Broadcasting. Thank you so much to all of you. Much appreciated. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Coming up, an election commissioner outlines ballot procedures ahead of the November election. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Hi, I'm Chris Boyd, host of Think, a call-in program coming to MPB Think Radio starting Monday, October 5th. Each day, I sit down with scientists, politicians, artists, and authors from around the globe for an in-depth conversation. Join me as we learn something new and take a moment to think. That's Think, starting Monday, October 5th. Coming to you weeknights at 10 on MPB Think Radio. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Karen Brown. The 2020 election is shaping up to be unlike any other as the coronavirus continues to affect how voters consider casting their ballots. A record number of absentee ballots are expected to be cast in Mississippi ahead of the November 3rd general election, the virus contributing in part to the overall rise in requests. In Mississippi, absentee voting is limited to a list of reasons, mainly for those who are 65 years of age, disabled, and those who will be out of the county, but some provisions have been made for those directly impacted by COVID-19. Others will still head to the polls to vote on Election Day. Hines County Election Commissioner Tony Johnson says poll workers in her precincts are mostly over 65 and part of the vulnerable population. She outlines ballot procedures for in-person and absentee voting ahead of the November election. About 75 percent of our uh, poll worker population typically uh, are more seasoned. Um, They've done this for many, many years, and a lot of them kind of fall in that critical needs category uh, of having underlying conditions um, than being older due to COVID-19. So some of them decided not to return. Um, We did get an overwhelming response of people that wanted to volunteer to be new poll workers. Um, However, due to the restrictions to COVID, um, training has been a little bit more condensed. We've had to Space it out, not allow as many people in there. We had to limit the number of people that we train per session. We've had to find an abundant supply of PPE, masks, um, sanitizer, uh, Lysol spray wipes, things like that, and make sure that we communicate and train um, poll workers on how to navigate the election during COVID to keep everybody safe. Um, So that's new for everybody. Have you closed any precincts in advance because of the pandemic? We did temporarily relocate four precincts so far. Um, Most of them are churches that chose not to just open during the pandemic right now. And with them being private facilities, of course, uh, we can't force them to open. We appreciate the partnership that we've had the last several years. Um, And that's what we did. One of them was located in a senior living facility. And as you know, um, some of the facilities, those were hot spots for COVID outbreaks. And then you have just an older population that live there. So you don't want to put them at risk. Uh, for the virus. So, yeah. And the other one was at Jackson State. Um, Due to them being a campus, large numbers, that one was relocated to the Athletics and Assembly Center. It's about 11,000 square feet, um, lots of space, lots of room, um, and allows one way in and one way out. So we, in a total, relocated four precincts due to COVID. We have talked to some uh, circuit clerks, Mm -hmm. circuit court clerks, about absentee ballots. And there is some confusion Mm-hmm. about the details of how someone can vote absentee. Are you involved in clarifying the process? 
We are. We get calls daily. We have received hundreds of calls since probably about July on the process of voting absentee, who can vote absentee, and when they can start. Uh, typically, we refer them to the circuit clerks, but we do answer uh, questions, you know, on a minimal level about when it started, which was September 21st, who can vote absentee, you being 65 years of age or older, if you'll be out of town, on Election Day, if you're a student. Um, we've also answered the question about having it witnessed or notarized before you send it back, as well as the absentee application. So uh, it's been a series of several steps that we've had to explain to the voters, and hopefully we've done a good job so that they can go ahead and, and cast that, that vote if they apply for absentee. And I know that they've added on some, due to the pandemic, uh, you have a doctor's excuse if mm-hmm. you're under quarantine. My question is, and this is where some of the confusion came up, is if someone is quarantined, they wouldn't be able to go in person to uh, to send their absentee ballot. They can't mm-hmm. get it notarized in person because they're under quarantine. It's funny how the law is set up. They would still have to have something witnessed or notarized. Um, from my understanding, they have to have a doctor's excuse if they're quarantined as well um, in order to do that. It is confusing, but there was nothing in the law that provided a provision that allowed someone under quarantine to skip any of those steps. So it means that a notary would have to come into a, to see a person in person who's quarantined. Right, a notary or a, a witness. A witness could be your neighbor, a witness could be um, your mailman who's off duty, um, someone like that. So yeah, unfortunately, um, it's a little confusing, but that's how it's set up right now. Are absentee ballots counted as they come in or on election day? They will be counted on election day due to House Bill 1521. Um, The good thing about that, we think, is that they're no longer sent to your polling locations uh, and handled by your poll managers. Um, That level could vary depending on the training and depending on the county. Now, I think we have a more uniformed way of processing and accepting absentee ballots that will be done at the courthouse uh, by the resolution committee. What about the ballots? Are they processed as they come in, or is that also on Election Day? That's also on Election Day. What happens is they come in, they're scanned and noted as the voter has have been sent the ballot back. Um, so if you sent yours in and it came in on a Tuesday, it would be logged in that we received it. The circuit clerk would, of course, keep it under a lock and key. And then on Election Day, the resolution committee will meet and they'll start processing those. So the votes are kept safe and votes will count, and that process is actually open to the public. On Election Day itself, I would assume that voters have to wear a mask, that they have to be socially distanced. Even if the mask mandate is no longer in order, would they still be required to wear masks? So there's nothing, if the mandate is not still in order, there's nothing that we can do to require them. Of course, we're asking them uh, to wear masks or face covering. We're even providing them to those that may not have it. However, uh, we do not have the position to turn any voter away. Um, for them not wearing a mask. Uh, Like I said, we would love for them to, to um, help, of course, reduce the spread of COVID, but we will not be turning uh, voters away without masks. We may offer other options such as curbside. If they don't want to wear a mask um, in the precinct, they can always, you know, vote absentee if they fall within those categories as well. So no one will be turned away even if the mandate is lifted. Anything else you'd like the voters to know, to think about before November 3rd? Well, absolutely. I want people to be patient, be kind. Um, Of course, bring your your photo ID here in Mississippi. We do have a voter ID law. Um, We are encouraging everyone to wear face coverings. If you have a disposable pen that you would like to bring um, to the precinct, we encourage people to do that. We will be providing some pens. However, Hines County is a large, large county, so anything they can do to help us out with that by bringing their own disposable pen would be much appreciated. Make sure they do vote it up and down and turn it over, Um, and let's have a safe and safe election. Tony Johnson is the Hines County Election Commissioner. Thank you, Tony. Thank you so much. This has been Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Thanks for listening to the Mississippi Edition podcast from MPB News and MPB Think Radio. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. And if your app lets you, leave a comment or review. We really do appreciate it. Remember, you can always get in touch with MPB News on Facebook and Twitter. And fresh episodes of the podcast are posted every weekday morning. I'm Karen Brown. Thanks for listening.